Chantel, you grew up the second oldest of 17 siblings just across the Murray River in a small little country town. You survived and experienced abuse, bullying, lateral violence and so much more. What was the driving force that kept you going even beyond what people may have expected? Well, that's one of the defining things is that I always pushed back when people wanted to put me in a box. And especially during the 80s and the 90s, you were either black or white, not both. And it was even growing up, I'm actually one of 18 siblings. Uh, A few years ago, my mum passed away when I was 20. So there's a lot that I don't know about my mum's story, about her family. Um, I kind of disengaged from my mum's family due to a bad experience with my grandmother and they were all products of their circumstances so understanding what I do about storytelling and understanding lived experience has allowed me to kind of become the woman that I am today but back then when I didn't have the knowledge and the skills that I do looking back and asking myself the same question how did I keep going Um, despite not fitting in for a lot of mob and then being too much for a lot of other mob. Too ambitious, um, too loud, too needy, too loving and then you're not black enough, you're not white enough, um, you're not sporty enough, not smart enough. So literally I had to go effort from a really young age and find my own path and that's been a big um, theme in my life is listening to my heart and coming back to having that purpose and meaning and if that rang true enough then it was enough for me to push through the trauma and the noise in my own head as well as push back against the world that just wanted me to I guess lay down fit in I remember when I was 15 probably a big um you you just come to those crossroads or those incidents that are really defining moments that you don't realize at the time and I had two teachers say to me I think I was about year nine And I had two very opposing incidents with teachers. I was a very strong-willed young woman who all I wanted was to have a voice and to be valued and nurtured for who I was trying to become. But I was also shaped by my circumstances and I was doing the best I could. I was the oldest in my household. Uh, Dad had undiagnosed depression. Mum was um, living elsewhere. And we had a very loving grounding base through my dad's mum, my grandmother who was our most stable influence yeah. but it was my connection to my culture it was that voice inside my heart and it was the willingness to fight back which kind of were the three things that kept me going but at school I was just I wanted to be a teacher I loved reading I was actually quite good at school But I had one teacher say to me I was more likely to end up pregnant or dead than I was to finish school because statistics were against me and that my brothers were more likely to be perpetrators of family violence than they were to finish school. And that was, how does someone even say that to someone else, let alone an adult in a position of power to essentially a child? How old were you? I was 15. But in in a few, with within a few months of that incident, another teacher who had been actually trying to help me this whole time, she said to me, I had frustrated the hell out of her this day and pushed her to the point of tears because I had a chip on my shoulder, I had a victim mentality and I was angry at the world and I didn't know how to channel that anger. So it often came out in in violence and um, protective behaviours. But she said to me, you have your head sucked so far up your own ass that you are part of your own problem. You have a lot of potential, but until you get out of your own way, nothing is going to help you. Now, that didn't hit me at the time, but it took root. Those, it took, the seeds took root inside of me. And many years later, that came back to me, that incident came back to me, and it made a lot of sense about going, well, there's always going to be stuff that happens, but it's more important. 90% of what happens to me is not my fault. But the rest is about what I, how I respond to it. I'm intrigued you were brought up primarily by your father. Yes. A white man. Yes. Yet you had that constant grounding in culture or that drive to be grounded in culture. How did you achieve that given that you weren't brought up in what would typically be referred to as a black household? 
uh, it was actually through Ami Sharon Kirby and my cousin's sister, Simone, it was my strong connection. So Ami Sharon's my mum's cousin. She was also my mum's best friend. So when mum left, um, and my stepmum was Aboriginal as well, um, that my dad was with from when I was six to about 12 years old as well. So, But dad was always supportive of our Aboriginal heritage. But it was only Sharon that kept me in in the mix like I was always at her house I was always with the other crew kids in the community I didn't see myself as white growing up in my mind I have dark skin but then I look in the mirror and it's like oh shit you're white <laughs> <laughs> well let's fast forward a few years and let's actually take the next, the last 10 years really and focus on that because it's been a whirlwind I think is putting it quite mildly You've done two years at Mesa, you've had three world championships in jiu-jitsu, three degrees, teaching arts and trauma. Yep. You've also been a Koori liaison officer or a cultural liaison officer. What drives Chantelle Thompson, as well as having, what, five children? Yes. So what's the driving force that keeps you going, keeps you smiling, and keeps you striving for another world championship? It's the warrior heart. It's this, and I'm a master life weaver. I have always had so many different strands that are that are weaving together at different points. However, the last few years I've been trying to untangle the 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 knots that have formed in that because I didn't know how to bring everything together. I have my own personal passions that I have always been ambitious and a big dreamer. I'm a hard worker and a big dreamer, but not so great at the strategy and the structure. So I'm the person who goes, I'm going to do, this. oh, look, shiny butterfly over here. <laughs> so there's a lot of different moving parts. But I've always had this determination to, when I first decided that I wanted to try and be a world champion, the idea whispered its way into my heart. Even I was like, um, no, I'd never been good at sports, like ball sports or anything mm. like that. Uh, I took me 10 years to finish my my first teaching degree because we lost mum during that period uh, I was struggling with uh, trying to show up to uni and, and being a young mum I was 22 when I had my first daughter and then I was 25 when we had the twins but at 28 it was there was a I think there's always a point for me where this current situation is no longer tolerable well what was it let's just go back a bit further then to the starting of jiu-jitsu now, from my research, I've read that this was a physical therapy to help you deal with quite severe, and we really mean severe, yes. postnatal depression. Who whispered in your ears to suggest, let's go jiu-jitsu? A little bit random, Brazilian jiu-jitsu well, at that. I don't think anything really is random. I think things find us. Um, our, our ancestors have a way of putting us on the path that we're meant to be. When I was 19, I actually found jiu-jitsu at 19 because I was actually getting into a lot of street fights. I grew up fighting. Mm. It, was, it was my way of communicating with the world, especially when I wasn't safe. However, once you turn 18, there's certain legal requirements that don't kind of hit you. And I was out nightclubbing. And if I was made to feel unsafe by a male, I would give them one warning. They didn't take it. I'd swing. And I got really good at it. And the thing is, I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed that physical violence because yeah. it gave me the sense of power that I was seeking. It made me feel safe. However, it wasn't. It was a destructive form of um, expression. So someone suggested me, to me that I should try martial arts. And we had a really small club at the point at that point. But it was actually at that point where I saw my husband George. I'd met him at the nightclub because he was a security guard. But then this was another meeting point as well. I was like, oh, okay. So. Being completely honest, it was the fighting spirit, but it was also a boy that got me on the mats. And I mucked around for a long time, but at 25, after the birth of our twins, now I had postnatal depression with Nacinta as well, my oldest, but no one spoke about it. No one, I didn't know that because of all the trauma that I'd experienced or the intergenerational trauma experiences of my family, both my father and my mother and their parents, uh, that this would happen. But with the birth of my twins, particularly my, my twin daughter, she was the tipping point for my sexual abuse trauma to really bubble to the surface. And that if I've learnt anything about trauma, what you're supposed to heal will come to the top. It's like peeling back layers of an onion, yeah. whatever you're meant to heal. You're not meant to go to therapy and, and blurt out your whole timeline of trauma because I'm telling you, I'd be there till I'm 90. 
But for me, it's whatever's needed to be healed will come to the surface. And with Jada, she really brought to the surface that at that point, my partner didn't even know that I'd had experienced sexual abuse. And I got sick progressively, more and more so over a, over a nine-month period. By the time my my twins were about one, I was in a really dark spot. And I got so sick that I got had an incident where I hurt my daughter and I almost took my own life. It was that that was the catalyst for me to reach out to my um, my husband and my sister after seeking medical help and their response being, we've noticed on your file you're of Indigenous heritage. We want to call child protection to do a welfare check on your kids and you should spend time in a mental health facility. Now, I'm a strong woman. I'm an educated woman and they still did that to me. Now, I'm younger women, like women who aren't as... Um, life skilled or as experienced as I am or as grounded in being able to use their voice what would that have done to them long story short went home and George was like well if you don't want to do medication you don't want to do these things we have to try something how about we go back to the mats and it was literally just one day at a time fighting the fight in my head my darkness to just show up to this space where I could be angry but what I quickly learned was that anger didn't serve me if it wasn't channeled because the, I was one of only two females at the time. I was getting beaten, getting smashed, and I was letting my emotions control me. But slowly I started to be able to channel my emotions. And when I left the mats, I left empty. Yeah. And it was that peace that I found. And then one day, a few months down the track, I looked over and my two babies were laying on the floor. And it was like someone had taken off a pair of sunglasses and I saw them for the first time. Now, I've always loved my kids, but that was the moment that I fell in love with them. Chantel, in 2014, you took a lot of what you seem to have taught yourself and learnt along the way and brought it into your own social enterprise or your own well-being organisation, Kilalana. Tell us a bit about Kilalana, the name and what its focus is. When we first made the decision to pursue this idea of becoming a world champion, the, the reason it I guess, grew stronger within me was because when I decided to share it with people, people laughed at me or looked at me in disbelief as if to say, how? How can someone like you? I was a mom. We had no money. I'd never traveled overseas. No one in, in, my, in my inner circles had ever tried to do, be an elite athlete or start a business to my knowledge or in my experience. And I got this pushback of going, where is our dreaming? Where is the sense of possibility? We are so defined by what is that we're not worrying about what could be. So I said to the hubby, I said, probably about four months out, uh, at the end of 2012, we'd done a massive year of competing. And I said, let's go to Melbourne and try and have a crack at this. Something that was really important to me, though, because it was a heartbreaking decision to take my kids off country. Now, they're also Pacifica as well. So their, mm. their grandparents were here. To take my children away from those close connections, to have that day-to-day -day contact was a big decision. But this, this calling was louder than those fears. But it was also important for me to maintain a strong connection to my community and to give back. So when we moved to Melbourne, I was, what could this look like? And it was always young people that I wanted to help because I was like, if I can help them learn from the mistakes or the experiences I've had, maybe they'll get further ahead than I have. And it's always been that responsibility that I felt to, to give back. So I rang one, um, one of our Barkindji elders and I said, this is what I'm trying to do. He's, he's like, you're trying to help people grow. And Kilalana is the word for growing. And it initially, I made a partnership with the Mallee District Aboriginal Services, our local ACO, and I said, I just want to give back. So during school holidays, we would come back and we would run a day and a half of the Kilalana program and we would do a boys' session, we'd do a teenage girls' session and we'd do a little kids' session. What are the focus things within the Kilalana program? Jiu-Jitsu was the vehicle and storytelling yep. and connection to culture. So we would run a yarning circle, we'd do some Jiu-Jitsu, but it was in the storytelling and the feed that would happen after that that was really the key focus in that I would ask the kids, what are the things that you're facing? Like, what are your struggles? And they'd be like, oh, I'm getting angry at this person. And then I'd talk about how we could process anger and owning, owning your own shit, basically, because if we don't take responsibility for our response to the world, that's going to dictate who we become and the options that we have. And we just progressed for that for quite a few years. And then COVID happened. 
I made the decision to come home to country, wasn't ready for it, but the world had other plans. And Kilalana is now a young women's self-empowerment, self-development life skills program that is grounded in First Nations cultures, ways of being and doing, well-being and standing in your power. And I bring it all back to that warrior heart because when we come back to our heart, our heart knows and, and can hear us. It bypasses the noise of the world and our social conditioning. But you need to have a warrior spirit in order to be able to live your truth and follow that heart. So that's where we're at now. And we've been running for 12 months where we've launched as a social enterprise, Kilalana's a social enterprise, that's going to support the Kilalana Warrior Key Foundation, which is the combination of both my Barkinjing Yimpa languages and it means growing warrior heart. And that program is now supporting 20 to 30 young women in the Mali region uh, weekly with a gathering where we talk about stepping into power, boundaries, what are microaggressions, red flags. So it's about creating that safe space where young women can find their sense of self and how do they walk forward with that in the world. Chantelle, I'm intrigued. You are talking constantly about culture and getting back to culture to help all the way. You're a proud Barkindji warrior, that's how you're known. You've always carried your Aboriginality, Aboriginality as a major point of pride. Yet what I find interesting is that whenever I read about you, whenever you talk about yourself, you will talk about your Barkindji and your Nyimpa heritage. You'll also never forget to point out that you're also of European descent. Why is that important to you? I'm glad you're asking me this question now because six, 12 months ago, I would not have been able to answer that. It's, I'm doing some work with um, an African woman and a queer woman and myself as a First Nations woman. We've banded together and we've created what's called the Better Together Collective. Gemma Saunders, Lillian Kakuvi and Chantel Thompson are doing this diversity and inclusion program challenging people in organisations how to have better, more courageous conversations. I'm a black woman with white skin. So when I walk into a room full of women of colour, all First Nations women, sometimes it's easy to be mistaken as an ally. I am, first and foremost, have always been led by my First Nations culture. That is who I am at my core. But it's also the thing that's hurt me the most. My mother is Aboriginal, but it was her mother that was the cause of a lot of my trauma. And my own community has come back at me and not just the Victorian community. Who are you to do these things? Um, you're not Barkindji, you're, you're this. And it's all forms of impacts of the trauma of colonisation on our community. It's a form of lateral violence. It is. Too. Lateral violence is the internalisation of, of that. And a lot of people, we're only just starting to unpack what that actually means. But I had actually a very dear friend at university point out to me I used to only identify as, as a Barkinjing Yimpa woman. She goes, but when you deny your European heritage, you dishonour your grandmother, my father's mother, who raised me. Now, at the time, I was just so triggered, but I was so angry at her and I lashed out. But when I stepped away from that and actually thought about it, I'm like, just because I acknowledge my European heritage does not diminish my blackness. I can be all of those things and I can weave them together so that they strengthen each other. And that's when I realised that I need to belong to myself and understand who I am at the core of myself and be strong in my roots before I can go out into the world. Because that's when I'm more easily triggered. That's when I'm more easily vulnerable. Whereas when I come home to myself, it doesn't mean it's going to hurt any less, but I'm not going to be broken by it like I was when I was younger. So when I acknowledge my, my cultures, I say I'm Irish, Scottish, English, Chinese and Sri Lankan. Now, the Sri Lankan is still a bit ambiguous because I don't have any actual fact, but the others I do. My children are also Pacifica. We're proud of all of our cultures, but the ones that we choose to live our life by and parent and love by is our Pacifica culture and our First Nations culture because that collective culture, that, that coming back to community and family are the values with which we want to raise our kids and, and live, in, live in the world. What does being an Aboriginal person, last question, mean to you? Everything. I'm still understanding what does it mean to be uh, an Aboriginal First Nations woman in the 21st century and how do I reconnect and learn the parts of my culture that are available to me and hand them down to my children whilst also 
making a living in the world, having an impact. And it's a complex question, one that I'm still exploring at the moment. What it means to me is following my heart, listening to my ancestors and making time to connect to country because they'll always be there for you if you make that time and space to listen. But as I heal myself and I find my voice and story, I'm also healing my ancestors and but I'm also laying fresh ground for my children to create their own stories based on who they want to be rather than being defined by by a role or a label or a title. And it's that storytelling. It's that coming back to self and, and doing, but also acknowledging that as an individual, I have a responsibility to the collective to show up and be my best self so that when I leave this world, I've left it better than I found it. Chantelle Thompson, thanks very much. Thank you so much.